What is going on guys? My name is Jake Gauze and I am so happy you're here with me today for another episode of Upper On Tap's Drunk Opera History Aperitifs. And today we will be talking about the GOAT of the Italian opera. You know him, you love him. I share a birthday with him, Mean Joe Green, Giuseppe Verdi. Now, on this episode of Drunk Opera History, we're getting personal. And I think the best way to get personal is with a drink in your hand. Gotta let the walls down a little bit here so we can get real deep. So, we're gonna watch a quick video on how to make a French 75. A simple but elegant cocktail. The French 75 just screams Verdi to me. A mix of gin and champagne for a light but delicious taste. And come on, how many of you are singing the Libiamo chorus in your head right now? Okay guys, let's make a French 75. So what you're gonna need is a bottle of your favorite gin, some champagne, simple syrup, a shaker glass of course, and some lemon. So, if you'd like to do this with vodka instead of gin, that is actually the French 76. And if you're a vodka person, go for that. First things first, we're gonna take the gin. Do about a shot, one ounce, one and a half ounces, depending on uh, how strong you're looking for in your drink. I'm gonna pop that into the shaker, which will be filled with ice. We're gonna take our lemon here, give it a good squeeze. And then just a splash of the simple syrup. Now, you know, if you like get it rained out. That's gonna look really good. Pop that guy in. Beautiful. Now, about two ounces of champagne. Two shots if that's how you're trying to play it, or just until you have the glass nice and full, whatever you're feeling. And now we garnish. So, if you cut a slice of your lemon and peel the rind off, you'll get this. What you can do is just wrap it around your finger, hold it there for a sec. You'll see it maintains its shape. And pop that guy on. And we got a French 75. Cheers, everybody. Now, while all of you are running over to the kitchen and picking up a cocktail glass so you can make yourself a French 75, I'm gonna hit you with this trivia question. So Verdi, he was a big Shakespeare guy. He actually had pretty much all of Shakespeare's plays translated into Italian for his own pleasure. Over the course of his career, Verdi wrote three operas based on Shakespearean plays. Macbeth in 1847, Otello in 1887, and Falstaff, which was based in part on The Merry Wives of Windsor, which was written in 1891. However, there almost was a fourth. Verdi was toying with the idea of working on another Shakespearean play. It just never got its feet off the ground. Do any of you guys know what it is? Now that we've got all that out of the way, let's get to the story. So let me ask you, have you ever noticed when watching a Verdi opera that there always seems to be this parental relationship that's being focused on? That was no accident. Verdi was always very particular about the libretti he would use in his operas, and he often went for a parental relationship as a focus. Verdi went through a lot of personal tragedy early in his life. In an 18 month span from 1840 to 1842, Verdi's first wife, Margarita Barezzi, and his two children all died of illness. While Verdi did eventually remarry in 1859, he never had any more children over the course of his life. Because Verdi was unable to help his ailing wife and children during their time of need, he often will live vicariously through the strong father figures he puts into his operas. A perfect example of parental loss in Verdi's writings comes in Il Trovatore, where Azucena is constantly mourning the loss of her son. This is encapsulated by her aria Stride la Bampa, which we will now hear sung by mezzo Joanna Pope. <laughs> Sì, <laughs> 
Before we move on to our next opera that we'll be focusing on, let's answer that trivia question. So just a reminder, we have three Shakespearean operas written by Verdi, Macbeth, Othello, and Falstaff. However, there was almost a fourth. Do any of you know what it was? A drum roll, please. Cool. The answer, King Lear, or for Verdi, Re Lear. We actually do have a four-act libretto completely written for this piece. It was written by Antonio Somma, the same man who wrote Un Ballo in Mascara. But Verdi never managed to write any music for the work. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about sadness and death, uh, let's lighten things up a little bit. Let's talk about Giuseppina Streponi. Streponi was Verdi's second wife, but more importantly, she was a badass. Streponi was an operatic diva in her age. She sang several roles in Donizetti operas and a lot of Verdi's early roles, including Abagaile and Nabucco, where they met. Streponi was an incredibly polarizing figure for the time. She is known to have at least one child out of wedlock, and her and Verdi lived together for about 10 years before they actually got married. In case you were wondering, that wasn't cool in 1850s Italy. Despite the difficult reputation she received over the course of her life, Giuseppina Streponi was Really a badass, there's no other word for it. And truthfully, if you don't know a lot about her, I highly recommend going and doing your own research because as much as I'd love to sit here and talk about her for the next 45 minutes, I'm on a time limit. While she retired from singing by the early 1850s when Verdi wrote La Traviata, it's pretty easy to see that Violetta Valerie is very much based on Giuseppina Strapani. And going back to what we were talking about before, Traviata actually has an incredibly prominent parental relationship in it between Violetta and Giorgio Germont. Their act two scene together is nothing short of iconic. You can really see the evolution of their relationship over the course of the music. Giorgio comes in thinking of Violetta only as a courtesan. He comes to realize that she truly does love his son, but due to social standards, it just isn't going to work. And then of course, there's the elephant of the room that she has tuberculosis, and she hasn't told Alfredo, and she's going to die. Sorry, spoilers. Point being, it's really magical, and we're gonna watch some of it right now. So without further ado, I give you Sarah Cooper as Violetta and Keith Brinkley as Giorgio Germont, singing an excerpt from Act Two of La Traviata. Ora si come un angelo Lavando e mande giovine, 
pues vos no lo veas. Oh, que le tiene rendeva. De no mudate in triboli, le rose del amor. A no mudate in triboli, le rose del amor. A preghi miei resistere, no, 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 Non è ciò che chiedo. Cercate, offerse sui. Or non basta. Volete che per sempre voi rinunzi. E dopo. check out more of what we're doing with Opera on Tap, check out our website, operaontap.org slash Boston to see more of the awesome stuff we're doing this season. And a very, very important thing on that website is the donate button. Arts organizations all over the world, of course, are struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic. Any sort of assistance we can get from our patrons is monumental towards helping keep us afloat during these times. Opera on Tap Boston has been committed to continuing to pay their singers during this time, and that is in part with your help. But anyway, that's all for me. Thank you again so very much for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.